Thank you, Ronnie, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Neta, as well, for organizing this amazing event. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to be here at the Good Food Institute seminar. And I hope that everybody got their coffee and you're ready to uh, take a small dive with me into the world of cultured meat. And because I come from the Hebrew University and I'm also an entrepreneur, I'm going to try to weave two stories together. One is the story of meat. Why do we want it? Why do we crave it? And the second one is how can we make it actually affordable for everybody, for not only for us, but for our children and for the next generations to come. So we we are in a very strange times. You know, the, the weather around us is nice and comfortable, even though it's a little bit rainy today in Israel. Um, but and, and this has been like that for the last few thousand years, a thousand of years, but, but humans in general didn't really evolve in this weather. Climate on this planet was very, very different for the last several millions of years. Actually, we evolved during the last ice age. And during an ice age, there is very little food to be had. So when somebody in your tribe finally managed to catch and kill a holy mammoth, the entire tribe would celebrate. And this, is, this was critically important for us because hunting allowed us to get the protein we need to make more humans, to make the tribe bigger. It allowed us to get the fat that we need to build the central nervous system, essentially expand your brain and become the more than human we all know and love. And you can actually see this in the record. You can see that uh, as long as primates uh, ate a general diet, uh, cranial capacity, essentially the size of your brain, was relatively limited. It's only where we started eating meat and then discovered the fire about two million years ago, that cranial capacity started to increase. Suddenly, fat was available. And you can see this massive jump that is very nicely correlated to our diet. And really, the most recent jump is right here, which is the agricultural revolution, where grain allowed us to grow animals and essentially eat them. This is the main reason why, as appealing as this is, and it is, you know, my wife eats it all the time, she's vegetarian, uh, it simply doesn't strike the same type of chords in us as this. You know, you can actually see these steak sizzles and some of you might be smiling. We are craving this meat. We can actually smell it. It doesn't matter how long you didn't eat meat, you're gonna have a reaction to a grilling steak. This is something that we can smell from half a mile away from the other side of the street because we are so sensitive to it. Now, if you're vegan, you might have a different reaction. You, you might change the craving to a disgust, and that's fine, but you had to have a reaction. You know, you can't be apathetic to meat. This is something that you simply can't do because of our evolution. We can be completely apathetic to tofu, okay? Uh, what is the problem? The problem is that we can't make it anymore. You know, we are, the world population is growing very, very fast. We have changing diets in India and China that have far surpassed the West in their meat consumption. And this is happening at exactly the same time that we simply don't have enough environmental resources, not water or land, to grow more meat. This is one of the biggest reasons why the Amazon is burning right now. And, and you can see that there is other effects of meat production as well. It generates about 16% of carbon emissions. It uses 77% of all arable land on this planet and 23% of our freshwater supply. So we are done expanding meat production. This is why a lot of companies are moving into uh, plant-based meat alternatives. And, and companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat have done an amazing job at getting the texture of meat correct. There's only one problem. While you can get the bite and you can get the texture, it's missing something. And the thing that it's missing is, well, the smell. It's missing the smell of the meat. It's missing the, the critical flavor of meat. Something is slightly off. This is why, you know, why I love the Impossible Burger. My kids don't really want to eat it. Um, and this is a huge issue. You know, the, if, if you have little kids, you know that. It's very difficult to, to cheat. They, they are very accurate judges of what passes as, as real or not. 
And the problem is here, the problem is the fat. You see, the grilling of fat is what creates those polar aromatic hydrocarbons that we all crave. And this is something that is very, very difficult to make synthetically, or you simply can't make it synthetically while making it safe. But there is one technology that can do it, and that technology is cultured meat. And the concept is relatively simple. You take cells, you grow them in bioreactors, and then you assemble them into meat. And we have been able to do that for over 100 years now. The problem is cost. You need about 300 million cells for every gram of tissue that you create. Now, people can talk about cost per kilogram. Don't believe them. Ask them how many dollars it takes you to make 300 million cells or 300 billion cells per kilogram. Okay, because you can dilute it however way you want. So that number is critical because industry is not even close to make this amount of cells for a realizable cost right now. So it requires a very different technology. Well, some companies uh, are focused on growing primary cells like adipocytes or stem cells that have a relatively slow doubling time and they require genetic modification to expand, we actually chose something slightly different. We're actually using connective tissue cells called fibroblasts. These are cells that replicate very, very fast uh, every time we get a cut, so they're very efficient in growing. The second thing that happens is because these are fibroblasts and not stem cells, it's relatively cheap to grow them. The culture medium costs a fraction of what it costs to grow stem cells, simply because they're phenotypically stable while stem cells are phenotypically not stable. Stem cells increase, exist in nature for about 24 hours and then they start differentiating. It's, it's, really the slab, the, 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 it's really the stage of the blastocysts. So it's very, very short. Uh, so you need a lot of growth factors and singularity molecules to keep them happy while the fibroblasts are really at the bottom of the phenotypic well. It's all the cells that we don't know that we call fibroblasts. So very, very few growth factors. So you start with a media that is very, very cheap. The last thing, and probably the most important, is that you can grow fibroblasts in mass. You can get uh, a yield that is about five to 10 times higher than any other cells in, right now in industry. So we start the process, and I'll dig a little bit into our science. We start the, the, the process with either embryonic tissue or adult tissue. And just to make sure that we are you know, abiding by kosher rules, we're not taking ever min high, we're actually taking samples from animals that have already been slaughtered for other uses. We are not doing the slaughtering ourselves. We take something that is already taken from kosher animals. It's essentially a piece of their skin. Um, and then we uh, expand the cells and we get fibroblasts. This also allows us to make sure that we adhere to every single veterinary regulation out there uh, as uh, not only the animals, but also our tissues. Once you get the cells, you allow them to grow naturally. And the fibroblasts are these unique cells that they can proliferate very, very fast and rearrange their chromosomes in such a way that they simply immortalize after 90 to 200 days. So this is called spontaneous immortalization. And it's unique because it's the only process we know that can give you immortal cells without genetic modification, either chemical or direct. And this makes our products uniquely GMO free. This is how the kinetics look like. You know, we isolated uh, cells from multiple lines, both from several breeds of chickens. This is how a breakthrough looks like, and then the cells start proliferating very, very fast with a doubling time of about 20 hours. Uh, looking at multiple independent events, we isolated cells from broiler Ross chickens. These are the white chickens that are very common in the United States. As well as Israeli Baladi chickens. These are native to Israel. Uh, they are beautiful birds and supposed to be a lot more, a, a lot tastier. Uh, and you can see that even though those are completely independent events, um, the genetics are very, very similar. Uh, they seem to be downregulating P53, uh, but their P53 pathway stays stable. Um, they downregulate EGFR, which is usually up in human cancer, so this is certainly not anything to do with cancer, which is very interesting. They seem to be completely independent of TERT, and they reserve many of the markers of fibroblasts. Uh, 
we don't only take these cells, we also uh, teach them how to, become, how to start growing as single cell suspensions. Single cell suspensions are cells that grow very, in very high densities. So we have a proprietary process to actually take these cells and make them grow just like Cho cells in industry, in massive high densities. Uh, once you create these lines, it's very, very important that you figure out that the cells are genetically stable, that they're not gonna change over time. Like I said, these cells are immortal. With one line, we could feed the entire planet, right? Because they will grow and grow forever. Uh, and one way of doing it is to look at the chromosomal map. It's called karyotyping. And you can see that the karyotype of our cells and the karyotype of, of the original chicken is actually very, very similar. Not only is it very similar, but even after a year of continuous growth with population doubling about 250, the karyotype remains stable. The cells do lose some chromosomes, but it, these are chromosomes that are generally lost in the standard culture of fibroblasts. So even primary cells will actually lose these chromosomes as well. Uh, looking, at, looking at the cells, we actually dug a little bit deeper into the genetics. We did a complete RNA sec on both these events, and we found that uh, even though those are completely different events, one on a breed of American chickens, that one on a breed of Israeli chickens, done in two separate labs, the overlap between the genes were about 75%, which is crazy. Now, not only do we have this RNA signature, now we can take it and try to match it into even every single gene fingerprint of known human cancer, right? So human cancer has known driving mutations, and there are almost a finite population, and we can see whether anything might be associated with cancer. Now, to the best that we know, we are the only companies that actually did it, and we can actually say in a very, very distinctive way that using our phantom analysis, we see absolutely no correlation between our cells and any type of, of risky pathogenic point. Now, once you grow these cells, you need to make them into fat, uh, if you want to get the, the smell and the, the, the aroma and the flavor of cultured meat. And what we're doing is that we have uh, uh, food grade agonists, essentially two chemicals that we add that are coming from food, that are actually coming from soy and sunflower, that allow us to take these cells and, uh, and push them into adipocytes, essentially fat tissue, that gives you the very distinct smell. And you can see how these cells become that. They become that in about four days, and about 85% of the population becomes adipocytes, which is very, very unique. Um, the last stop is the engineering, right? We are not only a biotech company, we're also an engineering company. It was critically important for us to develop a process that everybody could use as a turnkey operation that would allow us to create this massive density of cells. And the process that we're using is continuous culture and media rejuvenation. We actually actively remove waste products, ammonia and lactate from the process and recircle the media back, allowing the cells to get to very high yields without increasing the costs. And you can see what we can do. We can reach cell densities of about 108 billion cells per liter. That's essentially 36% yield. That means we turn 36% of the volume of the reactor into mass, which it's about 10 times higher than any other company in the industry. Now, what does that mean? It means that we can completely transform industry. And uh, we think that this is how a farm of the future is going to look like. And we're actually building one right now in the Hobart. Uh, a thousand liter facility is roughly the size of your kitchen. And, the, and the, the tank is roughly the size of your refrigerator at home. This tank can produce about 300 kilograms of biomass every two weeks or three tons a month of a plant cell hybrid, combining plant protein with cultured fat. This is the equivalent of making 1,500 chickens in your kitchen every month, or 10 cows if you really like beef. 
Uh, it's completely transformative, and because it's very, very fast, it allows, it will allow farmers to essentially change production very, very fast. So people usually eat chicken, but then Memorial Day comes in and they really want to eat burgers, so they switch to beef production. And then Christmas comes in and you want to make pork, so you're making pork on exactly the same facility using slightly different starting cells, and you don't need to take the risk of something going wrong and you have to exterminate a flock every six weeks or essentially eliminate your cows every 10 months. Um, it's, it can fundamentally transform farming in the, 20, in the 21st century. And this is how the products look like. This is our chicken skewer, very nice sizzle. We actually uh, made one in the Machne Yoda restaurant and everybody came over to see what was grilling on the, on the, uh, on the plate. It's, uh, it's soy protein and cultured chicken fat. You can actually see, you can actually take a closer look and see how our chicken compares to farm chicken. Uh, we get the same grazing, we get the same uh, caramelization, and this is a cross section. You can actually see the fibers in, anim in the farm chicken compared to our cultured chicken. It's very difficult to tell them apart. And in a sensory analysis, with people all over the world, uh, most of their meat eaters, this product got 4.5 out, out of five stars. Um, and by the way, we actually fed them sh chicken shawarma. So um, this is something very, very unique. And you can see that over 85% of the people eating our cultured chicken were saying that they will be more than happy to replace their meat consumption with that. And I can tell you my kids like it as well, which is, to me, the, tr the, tr the only true test. We didn't only make chicken. We also make lamb kebabs, for example, and burgers that are getting uh, beautiful reviews. Uh, the last time somebody tasted our lamb kebabs was in Switzerland, just a few weeks ago. Um, and there are uh, uh, beautifully cooked, uh, very similar to my mother's recipe. We come, we're coming from Egypt, this is how we eat kebabs. Um, and let's try to imagine what it means. So cultured meat can have this massive positive impact. This is how we think a farm of the future would actually look like. Um, we can produce 80% less global carbon emissions if we switch to, carbon, to, to cultured meat. We can essentially use 99% less arable land we can use 96% of the world's fresh water. And what's unique about our process, what makes us very, very different from other companies, that the waste products we actively remove, like lactate, they can actually double the amount of biodegradable plastics in the world. During the process where you grow the meat, we can actually grow the packaging material as well. The implications for that cannot be understated. Today, if you take a look at land use in the United States and around the world, you can see that about 30 to 40 percent of the land is actually used to grow cattle, pasture and range. Um, the, we're talking about 654 million acres. If we move to cultured meat, we need less than 1 to 10 percent of that area. Now, the area that you release can turn into a natural forest. Most of this area was forest, and you can actually turn about 80% of it to, to forest again. What does that mean? It means actually removing 59 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere over the next decade, essentially making the United States carbon neutral just by doing that. You don't need to do anything else. Everybody can drive a hammer, okay? If you just do that, you can make the United States carbon neutral which will give us time to solve our climate crisis and energy crisis. Stop and I'll be happy to take any questions and thank you very much.